monsters are a bit tougher now <laughs> in the multiverse. Why why did you do it? <laughs> why why did you make it tougher? So the lower challenge rating monsters uh their toughness is about the same as what it was uh, the last time people met them. But the higher you go up in the challenge rating scale, mm -hmm. the more you're going to find some familiar friends and foes in this book who are more resilient than they were before and who are hitting way harder uh, than they were before. Now this happened for a few reasons. One, we've got, been getting feedback for a number of years that DMs will often find that particularly for their high-level player characters, a monster that they thought was going to be a scary challenge ended up being a cakewalk uh, for a particular group. Uh, but then what's interesting is we will know there are other DMs who will run the exact same monster and that monster will bulldoze the player characters. Absolutely, yeah. Now, that difference always made sense to us because of how challenge ratings were calculated in our books prior to Monsters of the Multiverse. And so now I'm gonna pull back the curtain and talk a bit about <laughs> how challenge rating uh, was determined previously. So previously, when we would determine what is a monster's challenge rating, what we were doing is we were looking at what are the most optimal, meaning often the most dangerous things this monster could do round by round, and it was that sort of set of optimal, or again, most deadly choices that would justify the creature's CR. And so that's why I've even publicly talked about before, like a monster might have seemed to hit below its CR, but then if you chose a different set of actions from the stat block, suddenly it's hitting at, or it might even feel like it's hitting above its CR. That was again not a surprise to us because that again, CR before was just a snapshot of the most deadly options in the monster. Well, what we realized, getting this feedback over and over again, that often a monster would, uh, most often at high levels, be hitting, seem like it's hitting below its CR, is we realized it was too easy for DMs to pick a sequence of things that was not that set of most optimal options. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing now uh, it's not only in Monsters of the Multiverse, but actually this is already in play in Fisben's Treasury of Dragons, as well as in uh, The Wild Beyond the Witchlight. So this has actually been in the works for a while. We are now making it so that a monster must basically earn its CR in multiple ways if it has multiple sort of action sequence options in the stat block. Essentially what we're doing is we're making it so that it is harder for a DM to make a series of choices that will cause a monster to drop out of its challenge rating. Right. So basically we have, we're, we have uh, made it so it's just easier to use a monster and have it earn its challenge rating. Now, we have also preserved in our monsters that had them uh, non-combat abilities, which if a DM chooses them, will obviously make the monster not as deadly, but we've made it so that that's more obvious. Like, clearly, if you choose to have the monster cast Detect Magic instead of <laughs> <laughs> Exhale Fire, it... Yeah, but we've... But, Unless you've really, really changed Detect Magic. <laughs> yes, uh, but we have... We have made it so that that's, it's more obvious, um, but we've even actually given some creatures the ability to use non-combat actions like that, in a few cases as like bonus actions, so that even if you choose those in some cases, you can still use one of these other things that will have the creature hitting at its challenge rating. Uh, so I think people are gonna see less often this experience of like, it says the CR is 11, but it felt more like nine. Mm -hmm. uh, you're still gonna, you're, 
you're, you're going to find that the monster is going to feel like it's CR more, more often. But again, DMs still have the option to pick less deadly options, either whether it's in, they're in the stat block or simply by using the general combat options that are in the player's handbook. And this is still Dungeons & Dragons, where player characters uh, are not only uh, known to come up with clever ways to short-circuit how monsters function, but they're expected to do so. Shenanigans are a critical part of Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> shenanigans are like a yeah. Yes. I, love, I love that shenanigans are built into D&D. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean there there are especially some high-level spells that you know, might as well have a shenanigans keyword on them. Uh, time and, stop. <laughs> yeah, and that's and that's by design, right? Uh, because a big part of the fun of D and D is figuring out to how to create those moments that surprise even the dungeon master. And it's one of the reasons why the game f continuously feels so fresh. Uh, for you know, even those of us who've been playing it for decades and continue to play it regularly, we still get surprised. Uh, because the game has all of these wonderful ways uh, for people to create new combinations, uh, not only on the game design side, but then, of course, also on the role-playing and storytelling side. Yeah, there was a particularly absurd moment where my wife was playing her character, Whittle, and she, I had mistakenly handed them a scroll of Trask summoning. So cast Time Stop was going to summon the Trask. Everyone was yes ending like, oh, summon the Trask on top of our enemy. <laughs> <laughs> and then steal their stuff. Like, like the moment, like figuring out like delay blast fireball. And then the moment I steal their stuff, I've interacted with them. And then Trask falls, explosion, boom, all of it. Just a nightmare. And I, I did not see that coming. <laughs> <laughs> and you probably that. loved that you didn't see it coming. Uh, yes, yeah, it, it about melted the CPU in my brain. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah those, those are the moments in D&D I think people love the most. Are, are when the players get to figure out something sneaky, especially for a dungeon master, right? Yeah. Now, uh, something else uh, about this book that I love, and this is. This is, uh, I think of this as one of my more nerdy things that I love about it. Uh, it's not about actually any of the individual monsters or any of the playable races. It's the fact that we have re-alphabetized <laughs> the monsters. <laughs> it's true. Uh, and uh, we'll be doing this in our books more and more. It's a small thing, but any, any, anyone who's listening who's a dungeon master like me knows that sometimes you'll reach for a book and you'll be like, all right, I, I want to use Zugtmoy. And you might just, it makes sense. Go to Z. Go to Z. <laughs> Not knowing, like, like previously, well, no, you needed to remember that Zugtmoy is a demon lord right. and Zugtmoy is actually filed under D. So in this book, Zugtmoy is under Z. Uh, there are stu still a few little groups where, you know, a few monsters have been filed. But for the most part, uh, you'll find the creature... Uh, you know, near the letter <laughs> that's at the beginning of its name. Uh, and so I love that about the book. Again, this goes back to this theme of making things as easy as possible for our DMs and players uh, to use. But even further, the NPCs uh, that appeared previously in the Volo's Guide mm. appendix have also been alphabetized into the book. So if if you decide as a DM you want to use the bard, you're going to find the bard under B and not have to remember that the bard is actually at the back of the book in right. an appendix. A part of doing this, it also meant that all of those NPCs now get their own page. They now have art because the, the, most of them didn't have art before. And it's amazing art. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there is a lot of beautiful uh, new art in this book, some of which was commissioned specifically for this book, and some of it we actually developed in partnership with the magic team for the Forgotten Realms magic set. Uh, and so some of that art uh, appears here. And then it's like, this is one of those, but wait, there's more moments. Uh, with the NPCs, we also, because they had more room to breathe, so not only did they get art, 
but many of them also now have a customization table uh, that accompanies them. So going back to that BARD, when you go to the BARD, you'll not only get the updated stat block for the NPC, but the BARD also now has a table that you can roll on that tells you a particular BARD's uh, special type of performance. So especially for DMs who reuse NPCs, you might be, well, you know, maybe this bard was a musician, but the other bard was a poet. Well, we have a table that includes a number of options that the DM can uh, determine randomly by rolling or just using that list as a set of inspirations uh, for the different bards uh, who show up. And again, you'll find that kind of thing for the Archdruid NPC, the Master Thief NPC. Each of them has a table that is appropriate to them to help the DM bring some distinctiveness to those NPCs, especially if that particular stat block is used more than once in a particular campaign. If you liked this interview and you'd like to see more, go ahead and like the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit that little bell symbol so you're notified anytime a video like this comes out. Thank you so much for watching.